My name is Hannah Hayes. I'm a senior communication studies major here. If you were at the lecture last year, Wall Street, the great jobs killer, you might remember me introducing Bill Blackman as well. I'm also a member of the Jobs Now Coalition, which is a coalition that is dedicated to the development and support of a pro and program of public education and political <coughs> activism in steadfast opposition to the domination of our country by corporate elites. We are a nonpartisan coalition of diverse constituencies. Men and women of all races, students and teachers, workers, professionals, and the unemployed. Religious and non-religious, -religi straight and gay, all under the campaign banner of Jobs Now. We call for real jobs, good jobs, living wage jobs, environment environmentally sustainable jobs that fulfill the promise of providing each and every one of us with a reasonable share of our collective social prosperity. We demand the immediate adoption of full employment as the overriding national economic policy goal. We invoke long-standing principles of legal, nonviolent, direct action, and advancement of our cause. If you'd like to attend future Jobs Now Coalition events, please add your name to the sign-in sheet that's circulating around the auditorium. You can also like us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash jobsnowkc and follow us on Twitter at jobsnowkc. Before I introduce our closing speaker, I'd like to recognize the co-sponsors of this weekend's Outlaw Economics Teaching. The UMKC Economics Club, College Democrats, the Institute for Labor Studies, the National Lawyers Guild, KC99, <clears throat> Jobs with Justice, Move to Amend, the Urban League of Greater Kansas City, and United Auto Workers Local 249. It's my pleasure to now introduce William Black, who will give the closing address, How Bankster Banksters Broke the Economy. Dr. Black is an Associate Professor of Economics and Law at UMKC. He was the executive director of the Institute for Fraud Prevention from 2005 to 2007. He previously taught at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin and at Santa Clara University, where he was also the distinguished scholar in residence for insurance law and a visiting scholar at the Marcula Center for Applied Ethics. Professor Black was litigation director of the Federal Home Loan Bank Board, deputy director of the Federal Savings and Loan Insurance Corporation, and General Counsel of the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco and Senior Deputy Chief Counsel, Office of Thrift Supervision. He was Deputy Director of the National Commission on Financial Institution Reform, Recovery, and Enforcement. His book, The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One, <laughs> has been called a classic. Last night he was called a rock star. I think we'll all see that in a few minutes. Uh, he recently helped the World Bank develop anti-corruption initiatives and served as an expert for the Office of Federal Housing Enterprise Oversight and its enforcement action against Fannie Mae's former senior management. He teaches white collar crime, public finance, antitrust law and economics, and Latin American development at UMKC. Following Dr. Black's talk, there will be a short question and answer period, and then Victor and Penny will perform again. Some of you may have seen them at lunch. Dr. Black? So I wanted to thank again all the people that have made this possible, including the sponsors, but also all the people that do the volunteer work here. And if we could give a hand for the real star, the rock star. Okay, so uh, as you heard, I used to have lots of jobs. I'm completely unemployable in the federal government. <laughs> I'm so good at what we, uh, at the big law firm, I started that called uh, Career Limiting Gestures. Uh, and I've gotten at least two of my bosses fired who are presidential appointees. So along with us on a whole bunch of uh, senators. So I'm here, teaching. <laughs> um, and I usually start out uh, by saying, you know, uh, hi, I'm teaching you whatever the particular economics class is. Uh, but uh, the bad news is uh, that uh, my doctorate's actually in criminology. And, and the worst news is that I've managed to uh, considerably increase the hours I work and more than half my income. So I obviously know nothing about economics. <laughs> With these limitations in mind, we'll proceed to discuss <laughs> and, uh, and such. Okay, so yeah, it is getting worse, folks. Um, and that would be that down stuff, right? 
Boom. So we are back down in terms of income to about uh, 16 years ago uh, type of thing, um, which is not exactly the way things are supposed to uh, go in terms of the economy. This is on a real income, so again, this is adjusted for uh, inflation, and it tells you what you all know already. So, going onward, and uh, within this group, of course, we break it out by ethnicity and race. No surprise, it is the poor that get poorer uh, in all these circumstances. But again, that's the America that you know uh, pretty well. Now, there is a contrary story, and you may get hit with it, so let me tell you about the contrary story and the answer to it. So this goes in conservative blogs as the inequality myth. The myth that inequality is increasing, and say, ha, look. Oops, don't look. <laughs> look now. Okay, these are measures of inequality, and they're going down, and they're going down dramatically. So what's going on? Well, what if we looked over a slightly longer time period? Yeah, there are ups and downs, but which way is inequality going? If it goes up, inequality is getting bigger. It's going up, and it's going up a lot. So what's happened? Well, there was a year when the stock market got battered. A lot of the wealthiest income was in stock. To the extent it wasn't in stock, it was in mega real estate, which also got battered. And so if you looked at the wealth of the ultra wealthy, indeed, uh, 2000, late, very late 2008 through about 2009, you see a significant reduction. And, you know, it's not trivial, but it is a blip in the overall trend. And no surprise, it's going the other direction already. And so if you look at updated numbers that take you through 2011, you can see there was a dip in inequality. It was very brief and not very large compared to this huge time trend. And it's already reversed. In fact, inequality has, again, reached unprecedented levels in modern America. Now, you can see levels like this when? Right before the Great Depression, which is not a very good thing, right? We don't want to see things looking like they were just before the Great Depression. That, that bodes poorly for that type of stuff. So there are big winners. As I said, there was a brief period when their stock prices went down, but you may have noticed the stock market has essentially uh, made up all of its losses in this crisis. So what's the real story? Well, look at nine financial. It goes up a tiny bit, but overall you would say something like flat would be a descriptor. And this thing, this is the stairway to heaven. And no surprise, that's finance. And so think about that for a moment. Finance is a middleman. It's just supposed to take our savings, lump them together, and then loan efficiently to other folks. And as a middleman, the efficiency condition is it should be relatively small, as small as you can make it, and it should be as cheap as you can make it. Instead, it is unbelievably massive, getting bigger, and it takes a huge chunk of the money and wealth from the real economy. In other words, instead of helping us grow, it is a leech. It's a leech that hurts the productive economy. This is pretty much the same story, but again, it shows you over a long period, here's what? The Great Depression. And finance, finance actually lost for a time. What happens as soon as World War I, I'm sorry, World War II active participation of the United States begins? It goes up, and again, it's the stairway to heaven. And on this kind of scale, it looks essentially unbroken, which in the sweep of time, it has been. So ever since the war began in the United States, finance has been making out like a bandit. And this comes at the expense of the real, what we call the real economy and these things we call real workers as well. But 
you may have read home prices are starting to increase, but there's one sector in which they more than started to increase. A condo at 15 Central Park West sold for 88 million this year. This is 2012. And this is the descriptor of, of course, the real estate guy. And being a real estate guy, apologies to any of you who are real estate guys or gals, it's going to be just what you expect. The uber rich have finally unleashed the liquidity that was well known to exist. What does that mean? They were sitting on incredible amounts of cash. Are they putting it in productive investments? Yes, they're condo, the most productive at all. And so clearly they are no longer embarrassed to show their wealth. Well, thank God. <laughs> It was such a trying 16 months. <laughs> At the peak of the housing boom, when peak prices on trophy Manhattan apartment, now that's an interesting concept in itself, right? It's not a place you live, it's a trophy. Except instead of hanging the trophy on your walls, your walls are the trophies. <laughs> okay, Mr. Henkel is a longtime broker to the rich. Now, isn't that an interesting business card, too? Hi, what do you do? I'm a broker to the rich. <laughs> that 40 million, anyway, you know, it, it, look at the terrible time when, oh my God, 20 million, it's the new 40 million, when houses, those condos lost value. Not to worry. At the peak of the market, the record sales price was about $6,000 a square foot. So let's do that. $6,000, $12,000, $18,000. We are rich. We own this stage. Bad. We can all retire. Anyway, that has now topped out. And of course, he doesn't really mean topped out because he expects it to go up further and further at over $10,000. Well, that makes the math easier for non quants. 10, 20, 30. Yeah, that's really good. Now, in a report on the luxury market, it's interesting that the luxury market is big enough that you get special reports in real estate. He found that buyers uh, are around the world have bid up the prices once more, and now ah, life is restored. 80 million is the new 20 million dollars. So I just think a condo, 80 million dollars for a condo. Uh, they truly are not the same. And, of all things, there's this really conservative French economist who explained this a whole long time ago. I'm going to try to pronounce his name the way I've been told the French do, <laughs> with all the limitations of someone who butchers French. But I think this is Frédéric Bastiat, or something sort of close to that. When plunder becomes a way of life for a group of men living together in society, they create for themselves in the course of time a legal system that authorizes it, check, and a moral code that glorifies plunder, check. That's where we're going in large part in this talk. So, this is the world's richest woman. And this has not been photoshopped. That's <laughs> right? So, she doesn't use her wealth on her hairdresser. We can, uh, you know, so. And she has the solution. She, by the way, lives in Australia uh, and uh, owns things there. The evidence is inarguable that Australia is becoming too expensive and too uncompetitive to do export-oriented business, Ms. Reinhardt said, at the Sydney Mining Club. Wouldn't it be nice to have a mining club? <laughs> Africans want to work. That's like unlike Australians. You get it? And the workers are willing to work for less than $2 per day. Such statistics make me worry for this country's future. Think about that one. Now, that could be a really good worry, right? That if we set up an international economic system, in which Australian wages have to come down to $2 a day, under $1,000 a year as total income, 
Yes, that would be terrible, right? That would make you fear not just for Australia, but for the entire world. But, hint, that's not her fear. Her fear is my minds might not be competitive with those African minds unless I can find a way to slash wages in Australia to $2 a day. And she called for uh, basically gutting the minimum wage in Australia. And here is, of course, the little nasty. She got her wealth the way, the old-fashioned way, and she inherited it. And she's telling people in Australia that they need to give up all that middle class and working class and upper middle class stuff and just get, rid, get ready for the new future in which they're all going to be making $2 a day so that she can continue to export successfully. All right, and this in the United States has a whole philosopher, indeed the leading philosopher of conservatives in America today, Charles Murray. How many people have heard of Charles Murray? Anyone who attended June's talk better be, have their answer up. <laughs> Hand up. Okay, so Charles Murray is a libertarian in fairness uh, to him, as a, he describes it this way as opposed to conservative, although with Charles Murray, there's huge overlap. Uh, and he's probably best known for the bell curve, uh, which with his co-author, Hernstein, is now deceased, argued that blacks were uh, inferior genetically uh, in terms of cognitive abilities uh, and such, and that's why they ended up not doing so well. Anyway, Murray has weighed in and is very active in the current election cycle. And he's, as you, I know it'll shock you, but he's a strong supporter of Mitt Romney, uh, as opposed to the other guy. And he's writing in the Wall Street, Wall Street Journal and saying he doesn't get it. What's wrong with America? Mitt Romney should be a slam dunk for the presidency because Mitt Romney made a fortune at Bain. And then he adds his reasoning. Who better to be president of the greatest of all capitalist nations than a man who got rich by being a brilliant capitalist? Well, of course. Why not just elect? In fact, why have elections? Right? Whoever is top of the chart on Forbes, list of wealthiest people, should obviously be the leader of the greatest capitalist nation. And we would save all that expense of elections and all that storm and drawing and such if we just put the Forbes guy at the top. Of course, sometimes the Forbes guy is actually Mexican, but hey. <laughs> so someone else listened to Charles Murray because Charles Murray had another message, and it was that Bastia message about a moral code that turns you into a hero if you plunder. And so Charles Murray said, look, the problem in America, his new book doesn't talk about race, because that proved to be kind of difficult in the reviews of his book. So it's about the white working class and about the collapse of the white working class, right? So if his world, he divide, and he literally divides it up into these prototypical communities, uh, has the successful people, the rich people, and it has the losers. And the losers are not losers because they don't have jobs, because there aren't jobs. They don't have jobs because they're unwilling to work, because they're lazy, shiftless types of folks. Got it? And he has harsh words to the rich as well. The problem with the rich is that they're unwilling to preach what they practice in their own lives. They're unwilling to get into the face of the poor people who are begging on the corner and scream at them and tell them to go home and get a job and start acting responsibly. Right? And he's really fed up with these working class guys who aren't married as well. So they got to clean up their act and get married. All right. Somebody was listening. <laughs> Some of these rich guys listened, and they loved it, right? Because of the reasons Bastia said. It's really attractive, right? If you're plundering, to have a philosophy that says you're a hero. 
you're morally superior because of these things. And so this guy who was really rich said, there are 47% of the people who will vote for the president no matter what. All right, there are 47% who are with him, who are dependent upon the government, who believe that they are victims, who believe the government has a responsibility to care for them, who believe that they're entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to you name it. All right, so he got there right just like Charles Murray said, got in the grill and said, uh, uh, who, who, what working class people were there when he said this? <laughs> the caterers. What did the caterers almost certainly do in response? Videotape the mother. <laughs> Uh, Bastia wrote at a time well before there was videotaping <laughs> as a possible technical response to these people doing these things. Okay, but this has got it, right? And if that isn't sufficient, Mitt was, by the way, answering a question about how are you going to get the lazy, shiftless types to take personal responsibility. And by the way, <clears throat> That question came literally 10 seconds after Mitt Romney denounced Obama for dividing the country. <laughs> that's, that's an entitlement. And the government should give it to them. And they will vote for this president no matter what. These are the people who pay no income tax. Romney went on, my job is not to worry about these people. I'll never convince them they could take personal responsibility and care for their lives. So that's a great position description for president. 47%, my job is to make sure I do nothing for you schlubs, uh, type of thing. And if I can find a way to deport you, great, uh, type of thing. But I have a deeper question that comes from jobs now. So let's go back a slide. Government, these victims believe the government has a responsibility to care for them, who believe that they're entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to you name it. Well, let me name it, a job. But this is a really subversive answer. <laughs> because it destroys the whole responsibility stuff, right? Because what if these people actually want jobs, the ones who are capable of working, right? We're not talking about the 85-year-olds. We're not talking about the veterans who come back uh, as quadriplegics and such, although even some of those folks are, in fact, able to work. Are they able to work without governmental support and training? And Rehabilitation. This, the party recently voted down funds to help them, the veterans, the wounded veterans, get those skills, in which five of the Republicans who are sponsors of the bill voted to kill it. That's an interesting tactic, don't you think? This whole thing about personal responsibility, people who want to work, are trying to take personal responsibility, right? And what would they do if they had, were working? They'd pay more <coughs> taxes! <laughs> Nobody's mentioned this that I've seen in the debate that, that followed in commentary. But this is incredible in terms of jobs, in terms of jobs now. Because there's a bill that's been pending in front of Congress to increase jobs. Not the specialized one for veterans, but a more general one. Guess which party is killing it? <coughs> the Republican Party. Guess who is the leader of the Republican Party? Have you heard him push for that bill? So this breaks the whole theory of people unwilling to work, right? 
They're called the unemployed. The definition is they're trying to work. There are tens of millions of them in America, all of whom could be working within certainly months with a job guarantee program. So the thing that politicians always go after is fraud, waste, and abuse, right? And hey, I'm an expert in fraud. Stopping it, I hope, as opposed to committing it. Uh, but think of the central waste of unemployment. Tens of millions of Americans who want to work full time, who are unable to work full time because the economy is not producing those jobs. We are talking about literally trillions of dollars of lost gross domestic product. But it goes well beyond that. What happens when people are unemployed, or even to some extent when they're underemployed in a place like America? Well, first, they may well lose their health insurance, which is one of the leading routes to homelessness and poverty in the United States. You lose the health insurance, and you have a medical emergency. Hey, but not a problem, because you can go to the emergency, emergency room. <laughs> Wait a minute. What were those entitlements? To health care. They actually think they're entitled to have their lives saved. <laughs> when we have the ability to save their lives. They think they're entitled to have their kids not lose all their teeth and have preventative dental care. What kind of schlubs are these people, right? <laughs> Disgusting. And wait a minute, there was this tall guy, really handsome looking, who just three days ago, maybe four, said, me, good, me, good guy. I care for people. I ensured that every resident of Massachusetts had health insurance. Where was that? Health care. They believe they're entitled to health care. They're communists. <laughs> so there he was, and then a day after that, we, he explained what health care was like, right? Which is, no, no, preventative health care, but if you get sick enough, you come to the emergency room, and at 12 times the expense that we could have avoided, we then try to patch you up. And then we try to get you out of the hospital as quickly as possible because nobody can afford, because nobody reimburses this, you know, this type of thing. All right, so that's a little crazy, but back to jobs. Hey, what did he say his phrase was? My job. All right, so what else happens when people lose their jobs? Bad things happen to their entire family. Bad things happen in terms of depression, in terms of drinking, in terms of other substance abuse, in terms of suicide, in terms of just layabout guys that get depressed and don't help and you get higher divorce rates, all those nasty things, right? All that incredible waste that dwarfs every commission with their phony numbers about fraud, waste, and abuse, and never leads to anything. But this we know how to fix. This we can fix. We simply refuse to use the tools we know work to fix it. And the fraud is the economics. The claim that we can't do this because somehow government can never do anything productive. That we can't do this because we'll have ruinous inflation, the thing that never appears when you do these programs. In fact, they often actually lead to reduced overall wage levels. I'm, not, I'm sorry, uh, price levels. And the abuse? Well, the abuse is of the people, right? It's not enough that they leave them without jobs. 
It's that they need to be insulted and denounced and degraded at every possible opportunity. And we can break that if we say, what about jobs? Why can't you, under this philosophy, support jobs as the answer? Isn't it the obvious answer to social responsibility for those that are able to work? It is the great win-win in all this. Okay. Here's what Murray has phrased it. That openly judgmental stand, let me translate it. You are scum of the earth, and that's why you're poor, and clean up your act or get out of my doorway. That's the openly judgmental. Okay? This, that openly judgmental stand is no longer acceptable in America's schools, nor in many American homes. We have watched the deterioration of a sense of stewardship. <laughs> See, the rich used to take care of us. They had stewardship that was once so widespread among the most successful Americans. And the near disappearance of the sense of seemliness that led successful capitalists to be obedient to unenforceable standards of propriety in their $88 million condos. <laughs> Sorry, they're not condos, they're co-ops. Okay, so. Why? Why have the rich, supposedly, under Murray's view, lost that ability to discipline the rest of us and show the necessary stewardship to lead us along like a good flock in the right direction? Many senior figures in the financial world were appalled by what was going on during the run-up to the financial meltdown of 2008. Why were they so silent before and after the catastrophe? That's a really good question. Right? They're appalled. They know it's a disaster. They know that incredible epidemics of fraud are occurring. And they not only don't stop it, they don't even warn about it. They don't discipline their own peers. They continue to have parties in their then only $40 million co-ops. Uh, and such, with the, the cops, you know, the lobster and the caviar, and with the worst thieves in history. Anyway, back to the tale. Why were they so silent? Capitalists who behave honorably and with restraint no longer have either the platform or the vocabulary to preach their own standards and to condemn capitalists who behave dishonorably and recklessly. What an incredible pass, right? They lack vocabulary. <laughs> so we're going to have the next teach-in, a vocabulary <laughs> of how you talk to frauds. And here's some su suggestions. Turn around, put your hands behind your back, and I'm going to handcuff you. <laughs> That's the missing vocabulary. So, what was they gotten? Murray admits no peer pressure, no warnings. None of Bush's rich friends went to Bush and said, we've got a disaster coming, you need to regulate, you need to stop, you need to prosecute. None of them went to their peers, who they knew were looting, and said, you need to stop. In fact, the books are all about praising the guys like Paulson, not Henry Paulson, the Treasury Secretary, but John Paulson, the hedge fund guy, who carefully kept secret the knowledge that he thought things were about to crash so that he could make a ton of money. Now, he was one of George Bush's buddies and leading political patrons. And these people style themselves as patriotic Americans. What would you do if you knew America was being led to catastrophe. Let's say option A is you keep it secret and make about $100 billion, which is what John Paulson actually did, or B is you go to President Bush and try to warn him. Guess which option that he picked. And he's a hero to the right today and a leading contributor to Mitt Romney. All right, Lanny Brewer 
head of the criminal division. This is the U.S. criminal division. This is under Attorney General Holder, right? Uh, came from the same big law firm as Attorney General Holder that primarily represents big banks. Guess what? They're not prosecuting. So Lanny Brewer just gave a speech about 12 days ago to the lawyers, in, defense lawyers primarily, in New York City. And he gave them a roadmap of how they should argue to him not to prosecute the corporation. Right? And holding workers' jobs hostage turned out to be the key. You should emphasize how many innocent workers you have and that you can't hurt the capitalists without hurting the workers. So you must not indict. Right? They just have to get a complete pass. And he said, helpfully, the key is to get good economists. Now, what do good economists know about fraud? Nothing. But they're going to argue, yes, there are the poor, innocent workers who are going to lose their jobs. And of course, the workers are largely innocent. But if you take this approach, then all you do is make sure you're big. Because if you're really big and you have lots of workers, you have impunity to commit your frauds. And that's exactly the world that they've created of crony capitalism. So. <laughs> our criminology view. And it isn't just the guy at the top of the ticket, assuming he is at the top of the ticket, it's not clear, <laughs> as they do these things. There is one Representative Ryan, the most, the guy who got the greatest pass as an alleged serious guy. <coughs> I looked at the numbers, this is a complete farce and nastiness, all right? but. Krugman wrote a column about Ryan, and Krugman said this, in pushing for draconian cuts in Medicaid, food stamps, and other programs that aid the needy, Mr. Ryan isn't just looking for ways to save money, he is also quite explicitly trying to make life harder for the poor for their own good. So this is the Charles Murray thing. You're poor not because you're unemployed, you just choose to be unemployed. When you say you're looking for a job, and you actually go look for a job, and you don't get the job, that's because of you, right? You're really just a schlub. And the only way to turn you from a schlub into a human being is to make you suffer, right? You want to rely on government? Well, you know, this is back to basically Irish relief style during the... Uh, Great hunger in Ireland. We'll feed you enough where you won't die quickly. Because <laughs> we want some things built before you die. In March, explaining his cuts and aid for the unfortunate, Ryan declared, we don't want to turn the safety net into a hammock that lulls able-bodied people into lives of dependency and complacency, that drains them of their will and their incentive to make the most of their lives. Right? So this is the motif that the, these are just these schlubs that are sitting in a hammock. And as we all know, hammocks are for fun uh, as opposed to living in. The response of a guy that I was debating out in this really conservative, really libertarian thing uh, from the uh, Cato Institute, which not incidentally was funded and created by the Koch brothers, was as follows. He wrote this column. To be more specific, I hope Krugman is right in that Ryan wants to make life harder for the poor if the alternative is to have their lives stripped of meaning by government dependency. And I agree it will be for their own good if they're motivated to join the workforce. Well, good, we can test this. Have a jobs program. Let's not guess about it. Let's test it. Have a jobs program, and we'll see what happens. Because we know what will happen. And they know what will happen, which is why they can never offer a jobs guarantee program. Because it will destroy their entire theme of government dependency and lazy bumps. And that's what this movement that's why it's so dangerous. 
This is why they cannot allow it to succeed. Because it will destroy every aspect of their ideology if we ever offer these jobs and have them taken. So, their answer, of course, is, eh, what's so wrong with inequality? Why do we care? Not a question often asked by the poor, but a question often framed by the rich, right? In what way does someone else's success harm me? Such a viewpoint stems from the misguided notion the economy is a pie of fixed size. If one person gets a bigger portion of the pie, other necessity gets smaller pieces, and the role of government is to divide up the slices of that pie. In reality, though, the size of the pie is infinite. Well, there is some truth to this. It is quite true we can make the economy much larger by having people work, which they can never allow to happen because it would completely destroy all of this. But meanwhile, these people have made the pie smaller and they've taken such a large share of the pie that other people are suffering. That's what all those initial graphs were. But here they want to just do it as jealousy, right? And that they, their position is that liberals would actually like to keep poor people poor. But there's a more strident claim. Inequality good, inequality essential, greater inequality good, greater inequality essential, only thing that keeps America in the game, right? And so these folks, including Charles Murray, talk about trying to get entrepreneurs to do things that will almost certainly fail. That's their statement. And if you're going to be induced to do something that's going to almost certainly fail, then they argue you need an extraordinary profit incentive to be willing to do that. Except that that's not what rich people want, to take chances that are almost certain to lose. When they engage in accounting control fraud, it's, a, in the words of the Nobel Prize winner George Akerlof, a sure thing. When you gimmick the tax system to pay 12% taxes, it's a sure thing. When you send your money abroad to avoid taxation, it's a sure thing. When you put state and local governments in competition to give you subsidies, where you threaten as a private equity fund to close the plant, and you put the different localities in competition, it's a sure thing. It has nothing to do with economic risk by them or their money. The people at risk are the workers, which brings us back to jobs. These people simply don't believe that anybody does anything except for the prospect of immense wealth, which is to say they know nothing about normal people. Where, yes, compensation is important, but it is one of the things. The idea of dignity of work is lost completely to these kinds of elites. See, if we want progress, we need massive inequality. That's the Austrian economic answer. As a result, equality, who needs it, is their response. Now, meanwhile, all of these groups, look at the words they use, the adjectives they use for what's happening to CEO compensation, particularly in finance. Huge gains, leaps and bounds. This is supposed to be all due to skills, of course. And they admit it's caused a growing gap, whopping increase in incomes at the very top, superstar markets. It's always good when you're seeking contributions from the wealthy to tell them how brilliant they are. <laughs> it works really well. I can't bring myself to do it. Have come off, okay. These people are the big winners. This is Cato. Huge winners without any corresponding expansion. Wait a minute. Why did they tell us we needed inequality? 
to expand the economy. And why did they tell us that was great for everybody? Because it was going to make the pie bigger and then all of us would get more because the pie was bigger. So what happened to no corresponding expansion? <laughs> That'd be oops. And which, so what's their answer that they fall back on? Not skill, but politics and culture. Culture is code for you're a bunch of lazy scum and code for race in some extent. And politics, that's just right in your face, right? You want to be a winner? Buy a congressman. <laughs> right? Citizens United. It's a market uh, type of thing. If you're not willing to invest, what do you expect to win? That type of thing. So, here's what their actual line of all of this is. And the market economy has repeatedly tried to cut the most politically connected men of wealth down to size, but my critic's own political hero, Barack Obama, has supported bailing them out. That is not the free market's fault. <laughs> well, there's a little truth to this. That is assuredly true that the Obama administration has been a big supporter of bailing out the banks. And there are two recent books by insiders that disclose just how bad it is. And it's every bit as bad as we were, have been saying for years on that. What free market in banks? Their own economists at NYU, very conservative, say there is no such thing as a free market when you have these entities. And why do they think the politicians bailed them out? It's because of the political power plus Citizens United. So the strategy that they have, put every worker in the world in competition, drive wages to the bottom, They think, they're open that they think $2 a day is you know, an approach that you should use for a developed nation. I mean, just think about what would happen to the world economy if these people ever get fully in charge. Okay, I will end with, it ain't just money. Foxconn, which has such a wonderful name. Uh, <laughs> where over 2,000 of the workers engaged in a riot over working conditions. Right. Romney, think of Romney's reaction. He won't tell us which firm he visited in China, but he loves to tell the story to his don rich donors. He goes, uh, and their triple stack beds, something like nine to a room of 18-year-old girls, Uh, and they're, they're being paid 24 cents an hour. He doesn't emphasize that. Uh, and they're all this razor wire and security outside the plant. And he's, you know, going, whoa, this seems like a police state. And he goes, they go, no, no, no. This is to keep people out because they're so desirous of getting in here to work and such. And what does Romney see when he sees this world? Hot damn, we could make money here. <laughs> Not a catastrophe for the world. Not ownership run in a way that's going to destroy China and much of the world. Certainly not those cars in the riot. So what's happening in Brits? They elected conservatives. And uh, Mr. Cameron, who's the prime minister, the head of the conservative party, has been fairly open that the need to detoxify the conservatives because they're so want to making Charles Murray-like statements about everybody else. And that they were known as the nasty party. He said this, right? We want to move away from this. So who does he pick as their chief whip? Chief, the whip is the guy in charge of getting the votes together. They pick a former head of one of these British private schools where they beat the hell out of the kids, <laughs> who then went and became a top banker in the city of London, and then a conservative party leader. Is this going to end well? <laughs> so he's riding his bike to 10 Downing Street. Now he's riding his bike because the rebranding. We're greens, right? And he cuts out of the meeting with Prime Minister Cameron, and the police say, you can't leave that direction. You have to use this side gate. Okay, you know, security, these things happen. Not to him. He 
goes into a uh, profanity lit rage in which he uses the great insult in Britland, calling them plebes, as in plebeian, uh, and says, you have not heard the last of this, and does the old, do you know who I, what I am, type stuff. The police, of course, being good workers, write it down. <laughs> it's sort of like having a videotape. <laughs> uh, and uh, this guy may actually have to step down uh, as whip. We'll see what happens. Here's the New York Times headline in Spain. Spain recoils as its hungry forage trash bins for a next meal, with pictures of people foraging in trash bins. And the European Union official strategy is austerity. We don't give a damn about unemployment. Unemployment in Spain is over 25%. In Andalusia, the south, it's over 30%. In uh, the 18 to 25 year old cohort, it's over 50%. It is great depression levels, it is in Greece as well. And the official strategy is you have to get rid of all labor protections in Spain, and you have to outcompete the Portuguese, who are trying to outcompete the Irish, who are trying to outcompete the Greeks, who are trying to outcompete the Turks, who will eventually, we call this the road to Bangladesh, right? Because that's where it inherently leads. And this is the terrible fires in Pakistan their version of the Triangle Shirt fires that killed hundreds of workers because they lied about all the safety measures. They bribed the officials. By the way, the, there was an international certification process through NGOs who privatized. They didn't review it themselves. They hired a private group to check on safety, and they got clean pass just before these terrible fires. And as with Triangle Shirt, why? Well, first they kept the conditions unsafe, but second they blocked the doors. Why? Because like Triangle Shirt, they were worried about petty theft and such. And so hundreds of people couldn't get out uh, and die in these fires. And I'll leave you this with this one, as to just how bad this dynamic becomes. And these people should pray fervently that there is no hell. You can hear the, see the title, Job, uh, Judge, Texas firm must pay disabled workers $1.4 million. A Texas company that profited for decades by supplying mentally disabled workers to an Iowa turkey plant at wages of 41 cents per hour must pay the men $1.37 million in back wages, a federal judge ruled late Tuesday. The judgment against Henry's Turkey Service in Goldthwaite is the third of more than one million against the company after state authorities in 2009 shut down a dilapidated bunkhouse in rural Iowa where the men had lived since the 1970s. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen or worked at a, uh, a plant that killed, you know, prepares turkey. This is a dangerous process with lots of very sharp things. And if they keep the bunkhouse dilapidated and treat the workers like this, what do you think workers' safety was like? The 32 employees, now wait a minute, 32 employees managed to rack up over a million dollars in unpaid wages. You have to not pay them any wages virtually, right, <laughs> to be able to do that. They've been paid $65 per month to work in the processing line in a huge turkey plant after Henry's improperly deducted fees for room and board, care, transportation, and other expenses out of their pay and social security checks. You think the company store doesn't exist anymore? Or that it turned benign in the recent environment? Not so much. The amount they were paid never changed during the 30-year period. And they, of course, ignored overtime. 
pay requirements as well. Well, you know, they're disabled, mentally disabled people that probably weren't very good workers. Well, actually, the judge ruled and found as a fact that they performed as productively and effectively as non-disabled workers doing the same job, and indeed, they helped train their replacements when this finally came up. The law, that one million, that's just for two years. The law does not permit the recovery for the other 28 years in which they were looted by the managers. And the company had agreed and lied in 2003 that it was going to clean up this act. By the way, that was Lanny Brewer's discussion. You just promised to clean up your act. And, you know, then we give you a pass. We don't indict you. That, that happens all the time in the blue-collar world, right? <laughs> they arrest you and you say, I promise I'm going to really clean up my act. And they say, oh, well, sure, of course. We'll just okay. let you out right now. But it gets better. So these, I don't know, in, in your world, in my world, these people, if there are Dante's levels of hell, they're in the core, worst level of hell, right? What happens? The Iowa Attorney General's Office, by the way, they're the ones who led the push to settle the massive foreclosure frauds for next to nothing. The Iowa Attorney General's Office last year declined to bring criminal charges against the company or its owners, saying it felt that the civil penalty sought by the regulators were enough to hold them accountable. And in one sentence, I think we've summed up the problem with the modern world and its treatment of workers. So it isn't enough to just get jobs. We have to change the way workers are treated when they do get jobs as well. So, you know, first things first is getting the jobs, perhaps, but that's only part of the struggle. This is what people will do to save a few bucks and profit from folks. And as I say, they should pray very firmly that there is no hell. Personally, I'm, for the first time, believing maybe there should be a hell. <laughs> anyway, central message, jobs subverts all of these arguments against it. And they can never allow it to be implemented because it makes a lie of everything they say. Which is all the more reason why if we ever win, there will, it'll be very difficult to come back. Because you will prove most everything you believe in and you will falsify most everything that your opponents purport 